We want to take into consideration for the belt itself, of course, impact requirements. You can find impact uh, ratings through manufacturer's information. You want to be able to uh, be cognizant of the fact that if you have a, a two-ply 220 belt, you've already done the math that says from a PIW point, it's going to work okay. From a load support point, it's a small diameter, you know, small belt, 36 inches wide. It'll trough. The load support's correct. That'll work. But on the same token, you wouldn't have it on the same system and they're dropping 12-inch uh, granite rock on this thing, right? It just go right through it. So you got to have some, some res you got to have some considerations for impact resistance. The mass of the material is going to be impacting. You have to be able to look at the cover specifications as well. We've already done some quick information that says frequency factors, some ideas how to work through cover gauges. But in the end, a lot of this is skill and working with manufacturers through their experience that says they, we have these best results with this conveyor belt and this application. You've got to also look at the government constraints. In other words, the regulations take those into account because you don't want to be selling a non-certified belt into a certain type of application. Maybe it's a grain belt, and the grain belt has to be anti-static, right? And it's not. You sold them whatever belt you got cheap from somebody, and it's not a certified anti-static belt, and the grain blows up. Maybe it's not your fault. But eventually, through all the investigations, you think they're going to come back and hang something on you? Guarantee freaking it. What if you had sold a uh, standard grade two conveyor belt, plain old cheap off the shelf grade two belt to an underground coal mine, and this underground coal mine caught a fire and the belt line caught a fire? Nothing to do with you at all, but you have this belt that they track back that you sold it, and it's not an MSHA certified belt with a tag on it. You think they'll be hanging something on top of your head? Oh, yeah. And it gets expensive super fast. <laughs> So you want to take into consideration government regulations. You want to take into consideration the materials being carried, soft sandy material, gravel, sharp edges, wood materials. If you was to carry wood products, what's something else you might take into consideration as you look at cover compounds? What does the wood have in it? Oil. oil. And what's the oil want to do to the rubber compound if it's not been designed to be resistant to that oil? And swell it up, isn't it? So you have to be careful that you use the right compounds for the right application. Try to match the two together. You want to be pretty savvy on that so you don't end up you know, with a lot of liability later. And also, in loading the conveyor belt, we want to be sure to look at the type of, uh, are we loading on cushion rollers, impact beds, solid steel rollers? You know, if you have a solid steel roller and heavy product, a light duty conveyor belt, you're going to crush the conveyor belt and trapping it. You're going to go through the whole process being an issue later on. And of course, the conditions you load under. Is it being pulled out like a feeder? Is it being free-flowing? Off-center loading. Do you think this is a big deal? What if the conveyor belt is being loaded off to one side? It may be hard for you to see. Here's the edge of the belt. Here's the edge of the belt. Here's the idler cans. You've got about 8 inches of a 10 inches of idler can sticking on this side, product falling off the edge of the belt. A lot of belts are loaded off-center. When they're loaded off-center, what's that do to the stresses in the belt? Would there be more stress on that one side as it runs? Push the belt, you'll have a tracking problem. We're going to talk about tracking this afternoon. Hard to steer that belt back in place. So that loading condition is really important. Get that load in the center of the belt in control fashion. And of course, the abrasive materials. Is it soft, sandy product? Is it hard, sharp edge materials? Change the total cover thickness. Isn't the compound the quality of the rubber? It's cut and tear resistance. Tensile strength comes into play. And then of course, we talked about the regulations. Grain handling, power plants, coal mines all that sort of thing. So we've already done the frequency factor. We worked through that already. We've determined that that's a, you know, kind of a, a, an easy way to use as a rule of thumb. Maybe not perfect, but it, it's something to work with. You get a total thickness we need to work with. And of course, manufacturers can give you their recommendations. And you also get a lot of problems with this. And our friends from Flexco and ASCO and other manufacturers know a lot about this. If you have a lot of product built up in the system because you don't have a good cleaning system, what's that going to do to the conveyor belt? Right. I think there's a good chance you're going to grind the covers away the conveyor belt over a period of time because you've got this hard frozen material, sharp edge, it's grinding against because you didn't do a good house cleaning. Consider what we've talked about this morning. We've gone through a lot. But the, the core of this is when you're looking at specifying a piece of belt, there are several things you look at. Working tension is only one of them. So you have to be careful. You have to know about load support. We talked about that. You have to know about troughability. I'll tell you what, you're going to get more trouble more often with troughability and load support 
than you are with working tension. Again, going to the fact that most of the conveyors that you and I work with are somewhere from 30 to 60 percent anyway, and you're going to carry a 220 or 330 in stock to cover it. But it may not have the load support, it may not have the trough ability capabilities that you need in the system. Those two will cause you and me a considerable amount of grief because if it doesn't run, you're in, de you're in deep troubles. The other thing you need to, to be aware of, of course, transitions. That's something that if you go out in the industry and talk to anybody in the industry, including the OEMs, they'll give you that deer in the headlights look. Nobody considers it. And it's one of the greatest killers of belts we have.